Everyone, I want to I want to wish everyone a happy spring. And for some of you, it's spring break. And I'm uh, delighted that we have a really special guest uh, calling in uh, from from the, the eastern eastern seaboard. Carl Rabago, executive director of Pace Energy and Climate Center, is going to tell us about energy storage and grid modernization. Um, and uh, and I'm going to let him him tell us why this is so exciting and some of the different technologies. I, I only know that I, I, I did some extended study on this and a lot of our partners here in California are very deeply involved in, in grid level storage and it's just an exciting time for batteries and flow batteries and technologies in the grid. So, uh, so we're fortunate to have uh, Carl here today. Um, just the standard couple of slides about what is our program, our STEM high school program includes workshops, um, internships, mentorships, online courses that provide certifications to high school seniors interested in careers in, in energy. Um, we have uh, robotics grants, we have solar suitcase grants, and we bring in industry uh, speakers for uh, programs like our monthly monthly webinars. So. Here's our friend Brian Richardson in Madera South High School, who uh, who is part of the Solar Suitcase program and one of the Solar Suitcases. And so, welcome, welcome, Carl. Uh, thanks for joining us. Can you have a Can you give us a couple minutes? What was your career path? Where did you Where are you now? And where did you start? That's always something I think that the students especially love to hear, but I do too. Yeah, very well. Thank you very much, Barry. And uh, um, yeah, we don't have time for my whole career path. Uh, there's a a fancy multi-syllable word for me called peripatetic, but um, uh, my, wife, my wife just says I bore easily. So after college, uh, I was in the army, and uh, then um, I did uh, the army sent me to law school, and then my last assignment, I was teaching at West Point, the U.S. Military Academy, and went to school at night to study what was then an emerging field of environmental law. I found out that. One of the biggest sources of environmental pollution and one of the biggest industries in the world is the electricity industry. So I decided to focus on that. And the last 25 years have been a fun ride of um, doing a little teaching, being a, a little bit of a public utility commissioner in the state of Texas. I had a chance to manage renewable energy research and development programs at the US Department of Energy, did some time with some Nonprofit advocacy firms with a utility, an electric utility, with a global power company, and now I'm back at school, uh, teaching energy law and running the Pace Energy and Climate Center, which is a, a, a not-for-profit advocacy and policy shop uh, based at a law school in White Plains, New York. That's the short version. Wow. <laughs> Well, that, no, that's 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 so interesting, and I hadn't I hadn't spoken to you before about your career path, um, but it's it, that's that's very rich, rich rich a rich career and a and a and a wealth of things uh, important things that 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 Pace is 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 doing. Um, I don't want to I don't want to uh, take any more of your time, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you for for presentation if you're ready to go. I I sure am. I'll All look right. for the button and hope I click them right. Okay, it's coming right up. Oh, there we go. So let's see, I take uh, share and hopefully you guys can see it. We got you. All right, good. All right, well, um, so let's get started. I've got a bunch of slides here and they're assembled with the objective of providing you a resource that you can come back to. So I'm going to use this presentation as a opportunity to give you an overview of some of the important aspects of what's going on with energy storage and grid modernization. Um, I use the cute ready for liftoff because we're right at the stage where everybody is seeing and imagining what is possible with a truly modern electric grid and with the ability to finally do something we have really had a hard time doing economically in the past, which is store electrical energy, time shift it, if you will, you know, run our run our, our, our night lights off of our daytime solar energy and, 
air condition our hot afternoons with our nighttime wind energy. Um, like I say, something we haven't really been able to do before and therefore fundamentally changing. I also get a chance to show you a picture of my beautiful grandson, Jonathan, um, who's all ready for a STEM future. You guys just keep up the good work. Uh, he'll be coming along soon, he's two, um, but he's, uh, he's growing fast. So let's get, let's get jumping in here and I'll take you on a walk through these issues. Um, there we go. Uh, PACE, as I mentioned, is a not-for-profit center. We're a, a mix of people, law, economics, technology, and policy analyst analysis. We've but then spread outward to the Northeast, the U.S., and around the world. As I said, we're a not-for-profit project of a law school, so we also have a ready supply of students who uh, work with us as interns, and many of whom go off to pursue careers in this. Um, so let's get started. Let's first set a context for grid modernization and what I've been talking about this this sort of exciting grid. Once upon a time, if you were following it about 10 years ago, people talked about smart grid. Um, maybe not the best name in the world because it sort of asked ask you, well, what was it before, dumb? And to be honest with you, yeah. In the past has been kind of dumb. Uh, a one-way flow of electrons from power plants to customers, and just enough control to keep it working, but not a lot of interactivity, not a lot of information, that, especially with customers. So in the first stage of grid modernization, a lot of focus is just on bringing modern technology to the grid, but now we're at the stage where we're really talking about advancing functionality, meaning giving people and utilities more ways to do more things on the market, uh, on the grid. It's also important to know that this is happening at a time when there's major change in the electric utility industry. Probably the most, the largest capitalization, you know, or most capitalized industry in the country and maybe the world. Um, customers have been efficient with their use, so electricity sales are flat. Um, I put in a technical term here, worsening load factor. It means that our load is not evenly distributed around the hours of the day or the months of the year. It tends to get what we call peaky. And that puts a lot of strain on the system and imposes a lot of costs that we'd like to avoid. It's also true that with the rush to natural gas, as well as the availability of wind and solar at commercial scale, uh, you can't get as rich running power plants as you used to. Uh, the prices have gone down and stayed down. You may have been following in the news that there's a lot of coal plants in the Midwest and even around the country and nuclear plants that can't afford to compete with these new technologies and are, and are facing uh, the problem of having to go out of business. Grid modernization is going to make that worse. Uh, it's uh, making competition in the grid a much more serious factor, and the upper hand will go to those who can come up with better mousetraps and, uh, and, and ways to use them. And the final thing here is that we're talking about a growing DER market. We have lots of our own acronyms. This is the first one you have to learn. Energy resources. It really means all the services and products, things we can do at the distributed edge of the system, where you live, where the schools are, where our small businesses are, in the distribution grid. So grid modernization has the potential, as I've indicated, to really get customers involved to give them the opportunity to adopt some of these emerging technologies, rooftop solar, home batteries, energy control, advanced thermostats, lots of things. And a lot of it's also going to run on data. Now, we're not going to all become data hounds and micromanage our electricity system, but there are people who think they can make a living doing it. And that's the third party markets that I'm talking about here. Um, people who want to bundle together technology and information to offer you a service that, they, that you might find superior uh, or at least valuable in running your household, your home, your school, your business. It'll also give us an opportunity to keep the grid running smoothly with reliability and resilience improvements. That's important because we're facing increasing severe weather occurrences of all kinds due to global climate change where, uh, and due to the stress on the system that occurs just because what's happening on the grid is being becoming much more diverse. Many more actors, electrons flowing from the utility to the customer, from the customer to the utility, and every which way in between. Um, 
Grid modernization therefore also includes a big dose of information transfer so that utilities can continuously sense what's going on and move to repair it quickly or even better, have automatic self-healing capacities. Just like with old line-based, you know, long distance telephone service. If the lines going across the middle of the country for your coast to coast call get crowded, the system automatically reroutes telephone calls through Montana. Um, you'll never notice it, but the system takes care of it. Uh, and then finally, after we pay for and satisfy, satisfy the requirements of investing in new technology and getting displacing old technology, there's an opportunity for big savings in how the grid is operated and therefore how our, what our electric bills are. Um, but there is a challenge. Uh, a lot of utilities see this as an opportunity to shore up their declining revenues and rate base. And so um, regulators are involved to make sure that we really get the bang for our buck. So it's a big economic issue as well. So now take it down a little bit and start imagining a world in which we're not talking about the grid, but we're talking about microgrids. I sometimes use a Swiss cheese analogy here. These are, these are sort of the holes in the system. You still need the cheese to connect everything, and that's the grid. But people are increasingly talking about assembling around uh, groups of buildings, businesses, and functions with technologies. Um, they're particularly attractive because the technical definition of a microgrid is something that can run on its own even if the big grid is down. But what's really interesting is that the big grid is up most of the time. Microgrids have an opportunity to actually make money by providing enhanced reliability, service quality, and other benefits to the whole grid from the bottom up. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about maybe clusters of homes in a suburban context uh, along perhaps uh, with a hospital or a school, uh, maybe city blocks in a big urban area, or even we even have microgrids near here in New York City that are basically one skyscraper, which is its own grid capable of running without the big grid um, and taking care of the people that live and work in the building. Now, this is where we get into technology salad because there's all sorts of things that can go into it. Renewable generators, as I mentioned here, CHP, another acronym for combined heat and power, running an engine of some kind, and instead of having the exhaust heat just go into the atmosphere, running that heat through an exchanger and getting another cycle of work out of it. Um, storage technologies, we're going to focus on a lot later. I list them here. Um, intelligent management, as I've already described, and, and gateway technologies to manage the interface and the flows of services and electrons between the macro grid, the bigger grid, and the micro grid. Here's a picture to sort of give you a simplified idea of what can happen. Um, you connect these kind of loads, you make them as efficient as possible, you install some of this special generation as well as some energy storage and maybe some renewables, and the storage actually makes it possible to run a system that includes things like solar and wind that don't run 24 7 like an engine um, and and that means the concept of microgrid can be extended a lot further many people think for example that rebuilding puerto rico should be done on a hybrid microgrid basis where you use more renewable energy again wind and solar which keep the grid up with a lot of battery deployment. You may have read some about in this in the news. It makes a great, great case study for what can be done by rebuilding the grid from the bottom up instead of from the top down. So let's start talking about some of the storage technologies, run through these quickly. Again, these are this is meant to just introduce you, but um, give you a sense of the wide and interesting range of technologies that are out there. First, as general background, Understand that, as I've already described, this can be a game changer. It can really, really change the way we think about electric service, who's involved, who makes money, who gets savings. Um, storage, is tailor storage as a suite of technologies is tailored and capable to be highly flexible, which means it's got a lot of places it can provide value on the grid. But so far, we haven't, outside of a few places, California is leading the way, um, we really haven't done much to 
figure out how to take advantage of storage in the grid. And in many cases, old rules and limitations stand in the way of optimizing the value. So we have the potential of widespread deployment, but it's hampered by a lot of old things we did from a world in which we didn't have storage. On this slide, I want to point out the bottom right-hand corner there, a little bit of a, a, a brag, but also a, a useful reference. I got the logo there for IREC, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. It's a um, not-for-profit organization that generated this slide information and a lot of the stuff I've used in, or other stuff I've used in this presentation. IREC is a not-for-profit. You can find them at irecusa.org, and I'm proud to serve on the board of directors. We we work to try to make uh, storage and smart grid and distributed generation work well. We also do a lot of work with um, with the business, the jobs that are associated, job training for careers in this field. So you might find some interesting resources there. So. Let's plot out everything you can do with storage. I'm going to use two of these graphs, one that's got a lot of information and one that kind of boils it down a little bit. But this is a useful way to show that storage is a big term for a lot of different kinds of things you can do. This is a typical chart you will see, sort of interesting for people who uh, like graphic representation. Along the vertical axis, you've got how long does it spit out the energy that you've put into it? Is it seconds? Is it minutes? Is it hours? And by the way, there's value for all of that on the grid. Uh, and then the bottom, now this is, is me being maximally uh, technical. It's a logarithmic scale uh, that it takes you from one kilowatt all the way to one gigawatt. You know, fun with numbers. Um, that uh, shows you the relative size and sort of duration of output from these technologies. So top right hand corner, pumped hydro, big, big facilities making thousands of megawatts or hundreds at least of megawatts uh, up to the gigawatt scale. And then going all the way down to really high power super capacitors. There's capacitors in almost every electric electric device you have, just little things that hold a charge and release it on microsecond or second basis to keep the system operating smoothly. And a whole bunch of things in between, we'll look at them. Um, at the top, across the top, you'll see the major categories of use that they have, right? So the stuff that's relatively small is really useful for un uninterrupted power supply, UPS and maintaining the power quality of the grid. A uh, whole lesson on why we wanna to try to keep the grid running at 60 Hertz. Then the middle section about grid support and shifting loads, as I used in the introductory description, think of running the night light with your daytime solar, running your daytime air conditioner with your nighttime wind. And then finally, bulk power management. Again, those are those big units of power. Not a lot there that you, in terms of numbers of technology, the real value is in those two left-hand sectors. Okay, so here's a simplified version that also gives you another way of de depicting some of it using fewer of the technologies and grouping a lot of the ones that were in the other chart uh, that were individually into a big blue circle called batteries. Again, same kind of uh, axes here, but but giving you a feeling for how the market is shaping out in terms of where people are making these technology plays. There's also one on here that I'll reference is that people are always talking about super, con super conductivity and superconducting magnetic storage. Every time you have a geeky conversation about electric storage, um, superconductivity is a whole lesson in itself. There's some really exciting work there being done about what we call high temperature superconducting technologies. Uh, high temperature, that's the temperature of, say, liquid nitrogen. Um, you can figure out why that's high if you think about the Kelvin scale. Anyway, there's some stuff out there, and uh, maybe someday there'll be more, but like I say, it's a, it's a whole class all by itself. So let's start looking at these individually. Pumped hydro, remember this is big. and can work for a fairly long period of time. This is pumping water when the electricity is cheap, up a mountain, putting it into a reservoir, and then letting it fall when you want it. Um, it's uh, uh, really highly dependent on having the right place to do it. 
There's not a whole lot of them in the country and not a whole lot of places where we live in sufficiently mountainous terrain to take advantage of it. So really good uh, example of something relatively simple, but not that uh, capable of being ubiquitous because of the demands of the physical space in which it needs to operate. Uh, and by the way, this definitely plays on that price difference between high priced electricity during some periods of the day and low priced electricity in other parts of the day. If that difference shrinks, the investment in a giant facility like this can quickly be less than valuable. It's the risk of the large scale solutions in the electricity business. Flywheels go to the other end, another really exciting technology. They're, they're starting to show up. Imagine, I, I kind of use the metaphor of a beer keg buried in your backyard. So this is a device that has a spinning uh, a disc or other structure. It spins inside a sealed container, usually with a vacuum uh, on a bearing floating on air so you have no resistance spinning it up to 300,000 revolutions per minute um, and you spin it up with electricity and then when you want that electricity back you tap it back with the magnetic bearing um, pretty cool uh, but uh, if you don't get the shape of that disc just right it can also blow up on you pretty fast uh, some good work being done on it and it gives you an example of a very simple kinetic energy storage device that basically turns electricity to motion and back again. And I should say, by the way, that's one of the exciting, interesting sort of basic forms of energy type discussions that storage enables. The ability to talk about the conversion between one form and another and what the, what the efficiency losses are that accompany that and whether that makes it into a viable technology. Okay, compressed energy storage, take uh, excess electricity when it's cheap, use it to pump air into an underground cavern. Then when you want more electricity, you let the air come out and you don't have it run a fan, you have it accelerate the wind like a supercharger in another engine. So for the hot rod enthusiasts, you'll understand that if you really compress the air, just like on a jet plane, and drive it through a turbine, you can get greater efficiency out of it. Solid state batteries, that's that big blue circle. Lots of different kinds of things. Most of them depend on substances like I've listed here, lithium ion, uh, nickel cadmium, sodium sulfur. They're usually solid, right? That's hence, hence solid state. And we're basically talking about a flow of electrons across uh, an electrolyte from an anode to a cathode. You could do the same thing with liquids that are anode liquids or an analyte or cathode liquids, a uh, catholite. You can recharge with, but you of course put the energy in to recharge the liquid and then take the energy out from the other side of the liquid cycle. Run past them, it should be pretty cheap. You might be able to do it with some unexotic materials, uh, uh, analytes and catholytes. Not quite fully commercial yet, but some exciting stuff on the horizon. So what do we know about storage so far? Well, this chart shows you that while there's a whole lot of projects out there, they're mostly in that small space. This is a, another good example of data depiction, right? If you count up the number of storage projects, electric thermal storage second, and pump storage facilities and a few electromechanical facilities, but because of their size, pump storage dominates in terms of the amount of power being provided from all storage projects in the country. Um, where do they go? Well, here's a linear depiction of the grid. Actually, the grid doesn't work quite this way, but to understand it from the top down, the point of this is that you could put a battery in almost every place, usually at the interface between say generation and transmission, between transmission and distribution, between distribution and sub-distribution, between sub-distribution and customers. That's where storage seems to have real value is those, those intersections. All the interesting stuff happens uh, at the conjunctions of two different kinds of pieces of the system. And uh, this chart gives you a reference for that. 
This is a just a word version of the same thing. Bulk system is the big end. Infrastructure along the grid, behind the meter means at the customer's place of residence or work. And it's just another list of the kind of things on here. Um, let's see if I need to po point out anything. Um, you get into the really technical, geeky electrical stuff in that in the bottom left-hand corner where you'll see ancillary services. Um, I can't. electric grid is and how great our utilities are for keeping it running it's not just you know pedaling a bike and lighting a light bulb uh, keeping this thing running for all these people the way we change all our use the way the weather changes and all the other factors is it's, it's not it's not a miracle but it's pretty amazing science engineering and, and management um, the, this list of six items is just some of the very special issues that have to be addressed in keeping the grid up. Um, ask a utility guy sometime and 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 get an earful about um, how sophisticated the grid really is. So if somebody was proposing a storage project saying, hey, I'm going to solve this problem by just putting in a battery, um, and by the way, or any other energy project, Here's a list of the kinds of questions that you can ask, right? Everything from the economic, how much does it cost, to, hey, can I do this again and again and maybe make a business out of it? What's the market play? Bunches of other questions that need to be asked to really fully assess a storage project and to compare one to another, and more importantly, to compare whether a storage project is actually an improvement that. Okay, so let's do talk about value because ultimately value is what drives the decisions that we make. So first, understand that battery prices, and these are for the solid batteries, are falling dramatically. Look at these statistics in the top right-hand corner. 24% decline in the price of lithium-ion batteries just since 2016, and 80% decline in price from 2010. Here's a good question. Why? The answer is pretty simple. Economies of manufacturing scale, like solar panels and wind turbines and cars and cell phones, this is a technology that gets cheaper the more you make of it because in, you get bigger factories, more efficient factories, more efficient use of resources. This is the old Model T Ford idea of mass production. And it takes advantage of these, these falling prices associated with increasing capacity. Where does it work on the grid? A whole lot of different places and does a whole lot of different functions. In each of these diagrams, the simple thing to do is to look at the, the sort of the white line space and then look at the blue line for how the battery can change. And, and what that means you can do with managing the grid. So now instead of just assuming what customers do and taking it for granted, um, what you can do is actually change the way that consumption looks to the grid by using storage devices and do the same thing with generation. So as I indicated before, there's, very, there's a whole bunch of subcomponents to what we think of as electricity. Each of them has value that needs to be um, that needs to be analyzed in order to figure out whether this is a good thing. It makes a good sort of a case study for, for uh, uh, evaluating whether new technologies really are worth it. I apologize in the bottom right hand corner, it looks like it says Stomer service. I think the graphic cut over customer service. Um, another way of, just another way of depicting these values and what the grid has to do going from the inside out most people think it's just about energy. A few people understand it's also about capacity. But running the grid has a whole lot of other features to it that we have to consider. Um, it's not just turning on your lights. And we can take these values and stack them up to decide whether or not the total value that a particular storage project presents is good enough to beat the incumbent prices, whether it should displace something we're already doing by taking advantage of storage technology. So uh, a narrative description about walking you through these things. Uh, I want to turn your attention just really quickly to the 
third from the bottom bullet. The, a simplistic question is, is a project cost effective? But what we really need to understand based on these previous three slides I showed you is, is it cost effective for the services it can provide? That'll give you a much different answer. All right, let me keep moving through uh, so that I can uh, get an opportunity to the question period, uh, get you introduced to this stuff. This is another um, uh, aspect of this is that not all markets, as I said at the very start, are ready to give value to storage projects. So regulatory people, lawyers and engineers and other analysts have to work to make the grid system and the electric regulatory system friendly to electric storage. So let's run through a little bit of what we're learning so far. First of all, this summarizes some of those issues and what we need to do to take advantage of storage. There's a whole policy agenda out there. That this is a rapidly evolving technology space, so it was really hard for policymakers, much less legislators, to keep up with it. Uh, we need to learn from each other and not keep in reinventing the, the, the wheel. There's usually a practice trial run of some storage idea out there already. We need to build on it. Um, I'll just tell you that policy for this stuff requires these components, more stuff from IREC, and there's a full report that summarizes all this that I don't need to have you spend your time on right now. There's, um, what are we seeing? Right now, in terms of grid mod and storage, well, it's happening and it's happening faster, even though some states are just beginning their efforts. Um, extreme weather is driving an agenda, as I said before, that really focuses on ideas like resilience. Can the grid spring back quickly? There's evidence that seems to suggest that it can spring back if based on a, on a microgrid kind of infrastructure. Um, and, and many states and other places are working hard to sort of get these ideas into the field so they can use it for the challenges that lie ahead. Utilities have a lot of work to do. This summarizes what they should do if they want to be partners and embrace this technology. Um, if we look ahead, uh, we're, we're seeing that, that storage is already having some pretty dramatic impacts. Uh, Tesla built the world's largest solar battery in, the, in just under 100 days. Uh, so this, this stuff can happen quick. People are talking about electric vehicles coming along. And we all have a dream of one day those vehicles flowing, not just being recipients from electricity from the grid, but using their onboard batteries to supply power back. And storage looks like it's beating natural gas generation for power plants that run a very few hours. We're getting highly sophisticated computer tools to analyze storage technologies. This is one from Sandia. We've got estimates of market potential say that say the big growth is in residential markets, the idea of these small units that would be at the house or maybe community scale. Um, the game changer for the utility industry is that it already looks like storage, the red dot on this graphic, is lower than the top black line, which is the price of gas peaking units, those units that only run a hundred or so hours a year. And if the technology keeps improving, it'll start threatening. These power plants. Um, it is, if I was in the gas business, I'd be worried most about storage. Um, and maybe even um, we see signs of them fighting against it. Uh, there's some extra credit questions you could throw in here. Uh, if storage is good at my house, is it good in my neighborhood? The answer is maybe so, but how would you make it work? Um, you know, where do you put it? How do we cooperate? Do we do we do? Does everybody have an electricity storage co-op? Um, what are the what are the choices here? Uh, how do we deal with the fact that not only does electricity change during the course of the day, but that come from power plants that are in the system now also change over the course of the day, and we don't want to use storage to shift low polluting electricity or shift high polluting electricity to low polluting times. Uh, we wanna use it to reduce the running of high pollution sources. We need to do planning around our grids and we're learning a lot about system, systematic and localized planning, but it's an emerging field. We need to figure out how to value this stuff. Concepts like the firm spread or peak shifting value 
are rising up. Um, what happens when solar, which is also becomes so ubiquitous that we can overbuild with solar? And then, as I mentioned before, what happens if we can take the electricity from the battery in our electric vehicle and then add that to the idea of an autonomous vehicle that we can send wherever we need it? So now the power plant rolls to the load, uh, makes a little bit of money, and then uses a little bit of electricity to get back to a place where it wants to buy it cheaply. It's a pretty cool world to think about. All right, I've gone a little over time, but you've gotten a whole lot of information here. Hopefully there's something in here you can make a lesson plan out of or stimulate some creativity and imagination on the part of your students with. Certainly there's gonna be huge opportunity for everybody that I've mentioned from lawyers like me and policy makers and policy advocates to engineers and technicians and scientists. Um, maybe there even a role for politicians. So thank you very much for your attention on this. If we have some people on and we're set up for questions, I'd be glad to do some. That was, that was, that was great, Carl. Thank you. Um, we do have uh, plenty of people on. Are there any questions? And you guys would have to be. You guys would have to be. I have, I have one. Hey. This is Trini. Hey. Hi, Srini. Hi. Hi, Srini. Um, hey, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, presentation was uh, so wonderful. I mean, you covered a lot of ground uh, in a small period of time and very, very coherently. Uh, so appreciate that. Um, I was wondering. I mean, so um, it, you talk about the um, uh, certification program earlier that you alluded to, Barry. I was wondering if uh, um, there is anything coming on in um, with regard to storage and how you prep students and uh, uh, yourself to be able to uh, you know uh, get certified on topics related to what's coming up. Oh boy, I'm not real oh sure. I'm not real sure. sure. No. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, let me turn that. Let me turn that down a little bit. Maybe that. Maybe that. Maybe that. Um, um, one of the things IREC has been working on, I, I mentioned before the little shout out, is uh, concepts of micro certifications for uh, specialty, specialties and specialists in the field for people who work there. But other than that, um, I'm not really sure. So I'm gonna, that's a homework assignment, I think. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Um, is there, um, I, I really got a question that's curious really about. That's curious about. Do you find do you come across any resistance with regards to batteries? I, I I'm in in conversations with the public and social media. A lot of people are concerned about you know nickel metal hydride and heavy metals being used in batteries. And I'm I've been studying it, and I know that there are so many things around the corner that. Are using elements that aren't heavy metals. Do you have any words of wisdom on that? Uh, recycling of materials, um, longevity of materials, the elements that are used, the environmental consequences of different battery technologies. Well, um, you're right, and it's a really serious issue. Um, it's especially serious issue in the places where these things are manufactured. Most batteries don't have a, a major issue with spills, right? We have some of that. Uh, you know, we, we, we know we're all experienced with the idea of lead acid batteries and what, um, or at least I guess we all used to be when we tinkered with the batteries in our cars. We've all had a cell, a dry cell go bad and make that crusty stuff inside of a, an electric, you know, a, a electric device. Um, but the, mostly they're pretty well contained. So what we really have is start of life and end of life issues primarily. Uh, we also have sort of uh, um, elemental scarcity concerns that some people bring up, which is, you know, just who has all the lithium and how do we get a hold of it? Uh, um, so corporate sustainability type agendas and standards go a long way to expecting the manufacturers to be safe. But we do get a lot of this stuff from countries that, you know, have relatively low standards. So there's an agenda there that needs to be worked on. 
uh, if you will, sort of a kind of a fair trade and, you know, worker friendly plants and policies. And then we need to really get to work on our end of life processes. A lot of the valuable materials and batteries can be recycled uh, in order to uh, give them new life, but we need to not throw them in the trash. And um, yeah, the bigger the batteries, the more the bigger that challenge is going to be. Europe is leading us by far on waste management issues, and we certainly can learn from them. From an economic point of view, the pollution at the front end and associated with any leakage or maybe even fires, by the way, which has been an issue, or end of life is what economists call an externality. It's a cost of the technology that's not in the price, which means that it's not working efficient. The market isn't working efficiently. So it's policy's job to get those prices in that, by the way, will show the competitive advantage of cleaner technologies and I think spur the adoption and development of those cleaner approaches with, like you said, less, you know, less use of heavy metals and other uh, substances of concern. That what you heard right there is sort of the Adam Smith capitalist answer. Um, of course, there'll be some places that'll just say, we don't want them. New York City currently has a ban on big lithium ion batteries because of the fire concern. The fire department just doesn't want to deal with it. And um, they're gonna have to come to grips with, you know, whether they can or will. It's, um, it's an interesting issue, but if there's value there, people can find a way. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, am I allowed one more question, Barry? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, Carl, you had mentioned uh, the value stacking principle. Um, could you sort of leave, go back to that slide if it's convenient for you and then uh, walk us through uh, which part of the value do you see emerging um, as uh, recognized and uh, pushing towards uh, being uh, worked on for solutions? Yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, we, can, mean, yeah, okay we can, yeah, okay, yeah, back green. green. So let me, um, so let me um, see if I know how to operate. operate. This is actually a, uh, this is actually a, a topic, topic, uh, topic, uh, very, near to my heart. very near to my heart. I created, I created a slide, a slide that, I think, that I think 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 that background noise again. Sorry. Background noise again, sorry. Um, um, I created a tariff I created when I was in Austin. I was doing, doing this with solar. With solar. So, so, um, Barry, um, see if you can Barry, see if do whatever you did the last you did the last time times when I wasn't, when I wasn't, all right. or maybe somebody or else has got maybe somebody else has got the like on or something. Like on or something. Anyway. Um, so here's the concept. Uh, if you maybe you've seen one of those parfait glass desserts where there's the white kind of tapioca looking stuff at the bottom and then you have layers of different flavored stuff on top. That's really what we're doing here. And as you know, with the parfait glass stuff, uh, stuff, the really good stuff comes in thin slices at the top and the stuff at the bottom, you're not exactly sure of. I'm sure there's somebody who really loves it, but um, most people sort of eat the good stuff off the top and stop it, stop before they get to the bottom. A kilowatt hour of electricity service is made up of a similar stack of things. First, there's just energy, just the energy value. And this is interesting with storage because the energy value um, changes during the course of the day. It's more expensive to make electricity during the hot summer hours than it is during the late early morning hours or, or late evening or early morning hours. So storage gives you an opportunity to fill your battery at night and discharge it during the day when you can get a higher price. So even though this looks like a fixed block, um, the idea is going for the biggest piece you can. This is very well understood. We have giant wholesale markets that deal with it. We also, the next block, what was labeled here as peak demand is about electricity capacity, meaning that ability to turn it on exactly when you need it and to do so on a reliable basis. Every time I call you, you'll turn it on. 
This is also pretty well understood and highly monetized. Value for it is going to get greater uh, as this um, as this increasing competition in the generation sector uh, also grows. Um, but I guess I'd say it's pretty well understood. Then we get into things that are a little more esoteric, uh, maybe more valuable, but we're not sure, and we're not sure how to incorporate them. Reliability and resilience. What's it worth that uh, your house or your block or your neighborhood can come back online faster? I've lived through hurricanes in the Gulf Coast region. I can tell you it was worth a lot when my power was out. Um, but that's, you know, hopefully a rare occurrence. So we have to figure out ways to value it. And how do you pay somebody for putting in a system that can provide that value? How many times you're going to call on those operational considerations? Um, grid congestion relief is the idea that, like a highway, uh, a, uh, the grid finds itself very crowded during times. And if uh, the conventional solution is to build more lanes so that they get filled up with more cars too. But maybe you can start quantifying the ability of not having to build another transmission line, uh, not having to build another highway lane uh, by installing a battery system. Interesting timing difference here because you want to compensate somebody for putting in a battery that can be called upon to relieve a grid congestion condition at an unknown time in the future for an unknown duration of time. Um, so that's tough economics. That's like the economics of a fire insurance policy, if you will. Um, we know it's really worth it when we need it, but we all grumble about having to pay for it when we don't. And then finally, I had gone through the ancillary services. That little gray block is probably five or six layers of, of some really sweet stuff. But, um, but it's, it's, it's a small attribute with high value, which means it's subject to another characteristic here, which is if enough people come on with batteries to serve a particular ancillary service market, then the value of it goes way down. Um, so we have to figure out how to monetize something that uh, that by its very definition, you're trying to extinguish the cost of. So, so there's a lot of fun challenges in putting them all together. When you do this, you make a value stack that you then go to the regulator or the utility and say, would you please pay me this amount? And if you do, I can afford to put in a battery. Um, and of course the utility will say well gee I'm doing a lot of that myself why should I pay you um, and then we start having a discussion about that other question which is can you cost effectively provide these services and over time so that's the walkthrough thank you Carl. that's really really useful appreciate it mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. And I was just typing to you, Srini, there, there might be some online on-demand courses offered by PG&E in the world of um, new technologies, uh, regulatory matters, um, and, and, and the like. And if I'll, send, I'll send out a link uh, to all, of, all the folks on the call and really maybe everyone. It's a, it's a, it's a useful, it's a useful uh, resource. Um, we're we're using it. We're, we're going to begin using it with high school juniors and seniors who are interested in basic certifications, like around solar uh, solar energy installations and such. But there are also some very sophisticated courses that are offered by PG&E, both at their energy training centers and now increasingly online. So that's that's some good stuff that you might be able to, to take advantage of. Um, it does look like we're out of time, and I, we still have everybody, the, the few who called in, and like I said, I know it's a, it's a, uh, um, it's a, it's a spring break for, for many of us. Um, is Mark, Mark is on the call, and I think David, probably Yaroshek, uh, we have a, 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 at the end of every call, we give away a kilowatt meter. I'm going to, I'm going to send one to Mark Grobner. 
who is, I believe, at Stanislaus State. Mark, if you're on the line, congratulations. I'm here. Yeah. Thank you. Well, way to go, Mark. You're going to get one. I think David probably already has one. I think Serena won us our, 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 our thing last week. But more than anything today, I want to uh, I want to thank Carl uh, for for being on this call, taking the time out. You're doing some some significantly important things, uh, and really your your impact is is global, certainly national, and uh, and and to take the time out to help our our interested STEM and energy teachers out here in Northern California is is pretty remarkable and I'm uh, we're indebted to you Carl thank you so much thank you so much uh, I need just know should know by now that you, you just call me I'm eager to help you guys are on a good mission and and a shout out to PG&E too for for being a supporter of this important effort um, and for keeping the lights on yeah well there you go thanks so much Carl I mean you, you you'll hear from me I might think of asking you to another another call maybe we'll we'll carve out a, a a section of this gigantic topic for another call maybe maybe a few months out um in the fall when we come back would you be willing to do that with us i'm more I'd be more than happy to do it thank you that's fantastic um so i'm gonna let the call end then and again just thanks to everybody for being here and especially to carl for for uh uh for your uh, being our, our special guest today. Thanks everyone.